Hello. This story is about a seven-year-old boy that was playing a game of chess with not another human, but a robot. It's a true story that took place in a Russian chess open in 2021. The game gathered a lot of interest with the boy playing a robot. The game had a lot of spectators watching and enjoying the game until something very frightening happened. The boy rushed the robot in a certain move, and the robot did not like to be rushed, as it needed time to choose a move. It apparently had mistaken the boy's finger for a chess piece and broke his fingers. By the time the crowd could grab the robot off the boy's hand, his fingers had already been fractured. The boy continued to play the game with his hand in a sling. The management said that the robot was given to them by a loan and they had no control over it. Thanks for watching The Assassin Rapper and if you want to stay up to date on new content then please subscribe and be sure to hit the bell to be notified on new content. Jim was a drug dealer who sold all sorts of different drugs. He sold everything from crack cocaine to heroin to molly. He had different addicts queuing up for him every day. Jim used to have different couriers carry the drugs for him and sometimes he used to have kids carry the drugs because he would know if they were caught they would be underage and not get arrested. He used the ones he knew that their parents didn't worry if they were out late etc. One day Jim sold heroin to a known witch's son. Sheila was horrified when she walked in on her son Jasper after overdosing with a needle sticking out of his arm. She instantly cast a spell on Jim the drug dealer. The next day, after each one of Jim's customers got high, Jim felt the effect of the drug they took. It went on for a few different customers of his. He kept getting higher and higher until eventually he died of an overdose. Thanks for watching The Assassin Rapper and if you want to stay up to date on new content then please subscribe and be sure to hit the bell to be notified on new content. Michael first noticed he could see the future when he was a little boy. He was in the kitchen when he told his mom, be careful cooking, there is going to be a fire. Michael's mom Judy checked to see was anything on fire and it wasn't until a few minutes later there was a fire broke out, but luckily she put it out very fast. Judy found it strange wondering how her eight-year-old boy knew there was going to be a fire, when she was certain there was not one sign of it a few minutes ago when Michael warned her. The next time Michael noticed he could see the future was a few weeks later when he was in school. He was walking to school when he had a premonition the school bus in front would crash into a car. No one would get hurt, but he sensed it would happen, and sure enough it did. But luckily, like his premonition, no one got hurt. These premonitions carried on through Michael's adulthood. They became different though, because now when he had a vision about something, it wasn't clear. He had a vision that his friend Mark was going to end up in hospital, but he couldn't figure out how he ended up in hospital. Luckily it turned out to be something simple and not serious. 
Michael learned how to deal with his premonitions, and because they were so blurred compared to when he was younger, he even began to try to ignore them, unless of course someone was in real danger. One day he got a premonition that really shook him up as he could see someone was going to shoot him on Friday the 13th of January, and it was now Thursday. He became paranoid and locked himself into his room after telling his wife make sure no one would come into it. He was confident that if he made it past Friday the 13th then he would be able to live his life as normal before getting this vision. He even had his father's gun with him. It was Friday the 13th. Michael was sitting down scared so much that someone was going to break through the door and shoot him. He looked at the clock. It was only a few seconds to midnight. He hoped once he made it past midnight then he would be safe. Suddenly as the last seconds of midnight ticked away, his hand involuntarily held the gun to his head. He screamed in horror, never guessing the person who would kill him would be himself. Thanks for watching The Assassin Rapper, and if you want to stay up to date on new content, then please subscribe and be sure to hit the bell to be notified on new content. White walls all around. It almost looked like a hospital. It was clean. White tiles, white sink, white walls, and the roof was white. Since the earliest of times, white has been associated with purity and innocence. Then again, asylums are generally white, and they reflect the exact opposite of purity and innocence. Instead, those white walls hold the mentally insane, those that are not of sound mind and are a danger to themselves and others. The irony of the contrast between the two varying white rooms is ludicrous. He looked into the mirror, deep brown eyes gazed back at him. The freckles surrounding his nose looked as though God himself spread flakes on his face to create him. His brown hair sat atop his head, unkept. He scratched his head to cure a sudden itch and continued to stare at himself. His reflection stared back, unmoving. He opened the faucet and let the cold stream of water pour into the sink. After a moment he cupped his hands beneath the water and scooped what he salvaged in his hands onto his face. Some of the water splashed onto the floor. He didn't seem to notice. He stood there for a moment more, face dripping with water, still staring into the mirror. What he saw disgusted him, and he washed his face once more almost as if he was trying to wash his very skin off in the hope something more appealing lay beneath the first layer. He opened the medicine cabinet and slowly extracted a small box. He set the box on the sink and opened it. He removed a single shiny razor and placed it beside the box. He returned the box from whence it came and picked up the razor once more. He turned it in his hands thoughtfully, not diverting his gaze from the mirror. Razor in hand, he rolled up the sleeve of his long sleeve black shirt that he had worn to both parents' funerals. The thought crossed him that both his parents had since departed this world, but not a single hint of emotion prevailed from this morbid thought. He glanced at his now exposed wrist and back to the razor. The moment the blade touched his skin, he drew in a quick sharp breath. The icy feel of the metal made him hesitate for a moment. 
the razor shimmered in the artificial lighting of the fluorescent light bulb hanging directly above him. He put the blade down and sat on the end of the bathtub, head in hands and breathing deeply. He glanced at the weapon of self-harm and then at his wrists. Then back to the sharp, unforgiving steel he had placed on the edge of the sink. He wondered how it would feel to cut, to cut so deep the blood poured out of his sliced wrist, to see his blood spill and cover everything around him. The thought of blood made him smile slightly, ever so slightly. It was but merely a wisp of a smile, if even that. He liked blood. The thought of blood made him think of the time he took the life of a stray cat he had lured into his home, how it had purred contently while he had petted and stroked it, followed by the hiss of terror it let loose when he squeezed and bit into one of its ears, bit so hard he felt the cartilage crunch under the pressure of his teeth, but not before his teeth had ripped into the skin. The blood that spewed from the missing cartilage crunch under the pressure of his teeth, but not before his teeth had ripped into the skin. The blood that spewed from the missing appendage had excited him, and he laughed ever so sweetly at the sight of the feline's ear he had spat on the floor. The sounds the cat made were otherworldly, and one can only imagine the pain it was in after having an ear forcibly removed. He held onto it tightly, so tight it had become, so breathless, the sounds of agony had simply faded into desperate attempts to draw even breath to sustain its miserable life. Still chuckling softly to himself, now covered in the blood of the cat, he reached into his pocket and brought out the Swiss army knife he'd accumulated through less than desirable means. He looked at the blade after opening it, marvelling at the craftsmanship behind making such a beautiful smooth and sharp blade. His thoughts made their way back to the cat, and he turned the cat onto its back, lifting its head to expose the throat. With a slow, precise movement he had practiced in his head, he drew the blade deep and across the exposed neck of the cat. He sliced deep, but not deep enough, to sever the head. All sounds and movements the cat had been capable of carrying out ceased immediately the moment the knife penetrated and severed the blood transport systems. The blood that resulted brought a magnificent and eerily beautiful smile to the boy's face. The blood sprayed him and the surrounding vicinity, but that did not face him. Instead he hoisted the cat up and shook it violently in an effort to see just how much blood he could extract from the deceased animal. That was but the first of many animals that met their end at the hands of the sadist. He picked the blade up again, a glimmer of excitement in his eye as he pressed it to his wrist. He shuddered as the cold steel touched him, just as he had done to that cat. He pressed deep and hard and drew the razor in a swift upward motion. The cut was thin, as he was using a new sharp razor, but the pain was intense. He felt as though someone had set fire to his wrist. The blood was little at first and came out slowly. But as he set the razor down, he noticed the floor beneath him was covered in blood. His hand could not be seen beneath the blanket of red that now covered it. The blood would not stop pouring forth from his self-inflicted wound. He had cut too deep. He knew something was wrong the moment he set the razor down. With each bit of blood that escaped his body, it seemed to take with it an incredible amount of his energy. He slumped into the bathtub, blood beginning to puddle in it. His eyes fluttered open after having closed for a stint of time. He tried to raise his hand, but found he could not. Blood was all he could see now. It was everywhere. 
the bathtub seemed to be filling with it as it continued to pour from his wrist. He couldn't seem to keep his eyes open. They closed. He tried to open them, but found he could not. He could feel the darkness beginning to take him. He wanted to fight it, but his life force had been sapped with the immense outflow of blood. He decided the best thing to do would be to accept it. Eyes closed, he tilted his head back and did not even feel it hit the porcelain tub, which the force it did. He couldn't feel anything now. It began to almost feel euphoric. He felt disembodied. Nothing mattered. All that existed was the darkness. He wanted the darkness, and the darkness wanted him. It needed him. The darkness took him, and he went. With a smile on his face, he liked blood. Thanks for watching The Assassin Rapper, and if you want to stay up to date on new content, then please subscribe and be sure to hit the bell to be notified on new content. Driving without a license is amazing, and I wish I had done it a long time ago. I had lost my driving license due to reckless driving, and I had to redo my driving lessons. I couldn't be bothered doing my driving lessons all over again, as I was short on money. It seems like everything is coming on top of me. One day I had to walk in the rain, as I didn't have a car anymore and my financial situation had worsened, as I couldn't even afford driving anymore. Then one day somebody borrowed me their car, as they saw me walking in the rain. This person is my neighbour, and he asked me about my car, and I told him everything about me losing my licence, and not having any money. After hearing that my neighbour suddenly wanted me to drive his car, and he wanted to sit in the passenger seat, but said that because he had a driving license, it would stop me from experiencing great things if he was to be in the car. I started driving his car, and I noticed the rain never touched the car, and nor the winter cold air ever froze the car, because I didn't have a driving license. When I hit someone, I thought I had killed them, but then they got up and they said to me, because you were driving without a license, I am still alive. And she walked off. I couldn't believe it and it felt good to drive without a driving license. And I felt no road rage or even sleepiness. Even if I did purposely fall asleep at the wheel, any person I had hit and killed, they weren't dead because only drivers with licenses can only kill people. I never knew the benefits of driving without a license, and I wished I could have done this years ago. When I drive through haunted roads, and creatures of the night stop and stare at me, they don't dare cross the road when a driver without a license is driving through. It terrifies them, and when I hit my car against another car, who has a driver with a driver's license, it is instantly their fault, and only they sustain injuries and consequences of the car crash. Whenever I run through a ghost or a dead body, both of them become part of the living. Driving without a license is amazing. I still get chased by police, and I guess they don't want people knowing the great benefits of driving without a license. Thanks for watching The Assassin Rapper, and if you want to stay up to date on new content, then please subscribe and be sure to hit the bell to be notified on new content.
Darren was looking forward to his live stream. He was driving home from an interview with a publishing company about a publishing deal he had just signed. He was really looking forward to write his first book and was so thankful he was given the chance to be able to write one. He knew that his fans were very loyal to him, so he was glad he had something to share with them. He viewed his fans as his friends. When he got home, he got everything ready for the live stream and started talking about how his meeting went and how he is looking forward so much to get his first book published. He said, Hey everyone, thanks so much for your support and I have something really important and special to share with you. I am just back from a meeting tonight with this awesome publishing company and I will be publishing my first book very soon. Suddenly Darren heard a noise outside. He said to himself and his viewers, What was that? Then he went over to his window and looked out. He could see three police cars outside across his street. He took another look, then went back and told his fans what was happening. He thought maybe his neighbours had a fight, but he hoped whatever it was, everyone would be okay. He continued to stream until a few minutes later his door burst open. A man held a gun straight to his head and there was a shot. The shot hit the man in the leg and the police arrested him. It turned out to be a jealous fan who envied the success of Darren, who would have loved his success being an influencer. Darren made a video the next day and named it The Insane Fluencer. Thanks for watching The Assassin Rapper, and if you want to stay up to date on new content, then please subscribe and be sure to hit the bell to be notified on new content. A lady called Sharon Myers disappeared in a New York City hotel while visiting for a weekend. The NYPD were investigating the case, as well as a detective by the name of Jerry Wilson. Jerry had put together so much about the case and couldn't piece anything together at first, but he had then suddenly realized something very strange in the elevator's CCTV footage. It wasn't as simple as that though. He looked through the footage for hours, trying to see anything new jump out at him. The main things that jumped out at him was Sharon entered the elevator and went to the sixth floor. Then she seemed to step out into the hallway and enter the elevator again, then went back in the elevator and back down to the ground floor. She continued this three times, from ground floor to sixth floor, each time stepping out into the hotel's hallway on the sixth floor, apart from the third time. She wasn't seen exiting the elevator when it stopped on the sixth floor the third time. That is when she disappeared. Jerry couldn't figure it out. He sometimes walked through the victim's last steps to see what was happening inside their head or what could have happened to them meet their last living moments. But what made this strange is what made her disappear. He felt it stupid and even plain crazy, but Jerry had decided to get the elevator in the same pattern as Sharon did. Nothing was strange until he stepped out onto the sixth floor for the third time, and suddenly he felt very hot. And then suddenly fire burst through the hallway and he could see a figure like a devil or a demon. He saw the number 666 on the wall and he was never seen again. Of course none of the fire was caught on camera and not even Jerry in the hall after his third time riding the lift. 
He had realized what had happened to Sharon, but it was too late because now he had met the same fate. Thanks for watching The Assassin Rapper, and if you want to stay up to date on new content, then please subscribe and be sure to hit the bell to be notified on new content.